I'm Beth with GeekWire, and on this final day of International Women's Month, it is my pleasure on behalf of GeekWire Studios to welcome you to the first annual Voodle Visionaries Grant Finale, presented by our great partners at Voodle. It is now my honor to introduce today's MC, Nancy Poznoff, co-founder and CEO of Kingston Marketing Group. Nancy. Thank you, Beth, and good morning, everyone, and welcome. Kingston Marketing Group, my team and I are so honored and proud to co-sponsor this contest, and I'm really excited to be here to host this event today. Uh, for the past couple months, we've had the honor of meeting almost 300 inspiring women, non-binary, and BIPOC entrepreneurs from all over the country through their 60-second video pitches. Today, we're going to celebrate them, and we're also going to announce the winner of the $10,000 grant. Also, make sure to stay with us to the end because I do have a really exciting surprise for all of you. But first, a little bit more about the grant. This grant was born from a desire to create some real solutions to enable a more equitable world of work. We wanted to help ensure that diverse voices have a platform, and not just a platform, but the funding to help them be heard. Um, we know that women, non-binary and BIPOC business leaders have really been in the trenches helping create a better future of work. And as many of us know and are hyper aware, the statistics show that founders from these demographics remain grossly underrepresented in terms of funding. As a founder of a woman-led business myself, um, it really hits home, and I'm sure it does for many of you um, on this call. But I think this grant is just one great place to start. Um, and we envision this grant to be just one really solid step forward. Um, so for this competition, we did have a unique twist. Um, instead of asking for pitch decks, um, we had founders submit 60 second video pitches through the Voodle app. Voodle is a short messaging app for work. Um, and it was the perfect format um, for very busy entrepreneurs to be able to uh, create a pitch video and submit it. So the participants earned votes from the community um, once they posted their videos. Um, and we selected the top 10 through the community. And then our top three finalists were selected by our esteemed panel of judges. Um, and here are the judges. Um, We'd like to thank them for their dedication, their expertise. Uh, this is just an amazing group of people who came together to support the Voodle Visionaries Grant. Couldn't have asked for a better group of people to review all of these incredible pitches. Um, we have three of them with us today. Um, so we've got Priyanka. Priyanka is a principal with M12 Ventures. We've got AJ, who is the founder and CEO at ByteCheck and Maria, who's with us from Madrona Venture Group. So please join us in welcoming our judges. And again, we're here to celebrate entrepreneurs that are typically underrepresented and underfunded. And we're also here with the goal of contributing to a more equitable startup ecosystem. Of course, a lot of work is being done here already, but I would love to hear from our judges uh, who are with us today. I'm going to start with one question and then we'll, we'll have a little dialogue and um, I'm excited to hear your thoughts. So my first question for the panel is what is one concrete change that could help to make funding opportunities more inclusive today? And Priyanka, I'd love to start with you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Nancy, and thank you to the entire Voodle team and GeekWire and everyone. It's just such a phenomenal event. Um, since I've built my career in the venture capital industry, maybe I'll shine the spotlight a little bit on the venture industry. And I think that if I had to choose one concrete change, I would say that um, we need to aim for more diversity in uh, investing teams and in venture capital itself. Um, because yeah, I think that it's an apprenticeship business. It's a pattern matching business. And the more diversity we have in the investment ranks, the more diverse pipeline we can bring in and have an eye to and uh, include diverse networks as well. Um, I've observed in my time in the venture business that diverse venture investing teams are definitely correlated with better returns for investors. So it's not just a nice to have, it's a must have uh, for teams that are aiming to excel. And yeah, I mean, 
I think the main issue I've seen uh, is that VC firms are very small and it's been, a, and there's high turnover at, at the partner level and in the senior ranks. And VC really is an apprenticeship business with a heavy reliance on existing networks and pattern matching. So I think that um, we need just to put some concrete suggestions out there, more transparent uh, partner hiring processes in venture capital, scout programs to build the ranks of uh, diverse pipeline and um, new ecosystems system organizations promoting investor and entrepreneur diversity, like all rays, like the inaugural Beetle Visionaries uh, competition and grant. Um, yeah, I'm very hopeful. And I think that as venture capitalists, we need to do our part to uh, increase better diverse pipeline. Thank you. Awesome. Great. AJ, how about you? Yeah, Priyanka stole mine, uh, which I figured <laughs> that was going to happen. I knew it was going to happen. I was going to say the same thing of diversifying investment teams, but I, I have another one. But before I do, I'm also extremely grateful to be here and uh, to be a part of this event uh, and, and support what Boodle's doing and, and thankful for GeekWire for having me and all this work that goes behind the scenes on this stuff. I know how hard it is to put an event on. So thank you um, so much for everyone that's done it. Um, and I would say along with diversifying investment teams, I think there are a lot of funds out there. There's a lot of ecosystems. There's events like this that exist to get more money into minority and underrepresented groups that are building really cool companies. And we need more of these corporate institutions that made all of these claims back in March of 2020 of all the ways that they're gonna support uh, black people after the murder of George Floyd. They need to go out and invest in these funds. Uh, if you kind of look at who are some of the institutional LPs of a lot of the funds that are doing really good work, uh, you're probably gonna be, if you compare that list to those lists, it's not gonna be this a one for one match. Um, so we need more, more of those institutions to put the money where the people that are doing the work. I, I see, you know, you always see other announcements of new fundraise and all of this stuff, but there's a lot of really small VC funds that are doing some really good work in the community to get um, investment into these groups that specifically have thesis for these underrepresented groups. And I think we should continue to challenge the, the, those folks. We should continue to challenge the norms of where are you doing, where are you investing? Or is there some strategy behind that? Or is it going into the same thing that Priyanka mentioned of the same networks and the same old clubs that you've that you've always been in? So that would be my advice from a concrete perspective. I think we really should have a, a kind of an era of accountability coming up uh, where we go back and look at all of those promises that were made. And let's see if, it, if there was any change. Did anything happen? Did that big corporation that said they're going to promise X amount of dollars, did that happen? Did they do that? And if they didn't, Let's get it into the hands of the folks like Maria and Priyanka and others and, and Boodle for these competitions that are going to invest in the places that we know need more um, funding. Awesome. Maria, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so thank you so much for everyone being here today. This is absolutely awesome. And it's great to be doing this with Boodle and GeekWire. Um, Priyanka also uh, stole mine, but I'll add on to it and I'll add something else. Um, venture capitalist is, is truly a network and trust-based industry and in that you see a lot of times where um, investors will get a referral to an entrepreneur from a friend and then invest because they have this trust built with this person and this network and knowing that that entrepreneur can handle this capital that's being given to them. Um, and so often if the team internally at the firm isn't diverse and doesn't have a diverse pipeline of a network, that results in less um, diversity in terms of capital going to entrepreneurs. And so I think it really starts internally with firms hiring diverse talent, um, and making sure they have diversity sitting around their um, table when they're at investment committee. But um, beyond that, I think it's also super important to have programs like this with Boodle um, and other programs to help entrepreneurs. Um, get in front of investors and um, make sure they come with very prepared, polished pitches um, so that when entrepreneurs are ready to pitch, they have all the facts they need to make sure they're really set up for success in those meetings to raise successfully. Great, great suggestion. Um, AJ, I would love to hear more from you about your recent um, raise um, and congratulations, by the way. But if you could tell us a little bit about that process, um, my understanding was almost entirely made up of, of black led funds and investors. And you mentioned up front, like there are funds out there. Um, so if you could share kind of how you've accomplished that, I'd love to hear more. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and thank you. Uh, we were able to successfully raise uh, $3 million and 82% of our investors were black led funds or black angel investors, which was, was, was really cool for me because of the work that they're doing. Uh, so I'm motivated every day to continue to build this into a really big company so that they have great returns and they can go out and deploy more capital into underrepresented founders. I feel like that's a part of one of the secret missions of Bite Check is for us to grow so that all of the people that invested in us can then do this again uh, with another founder and, and continue to help grow this. But um, the way that it worked out was a lot of no's. <laughs> I got told no a lot. Um, before my first yes, I had 53 no's um, from different VC firms and, and, and other folks that I was talking to. Uh, and I realized that the more firms that I talk to, understanding um, their thesis and understanding the type of people they invest in, it's a lot easier when you're on a 30 minute call and you don't have to explain who you are for half of the call and, and talk about yourself and try to defend your background where when I was talking to these um, uh, VC firms that were black led or had thesis around investing in, in, in black founders or minority founders, I got to talk about the business. I got to talk mm -hmm. about uh, what I was building, the product and, and, and why we are on the right track to solve this, this really important problem. And that just made things better. And, and when you have a hop on a call and there's a shared understanding of the struggle of doing this as an underrepresented founder, the things that we go through, some of the questions that I've, I've gotten asked in some of these meetings are like just mind blowing that someone would, would ask that question. But there's a shared understanding there. It allows you to really feel a little bit more comfortable about the process um, because 53 knows after a while you start to think like, I don't know if this is going to work. Uh, I don't know if, uh, if I'm the right person to get invested in, but you are. Uh, you, you definitely are. And I would say to anyone listening to this that is going out and raising, um, find your tribe in, that, in, in the VC space. Find the people that have the thesis to invest in what you're, what you're building, both from a product and market and industry perspective, but also like look at the portfolio. Like what are the type of founders that they have invested in? Um, is, there, is there some synergy between who you are and what you believe in and those founders? Um, because once you do, it makes the process a lot easier. And um, I'm extremely grateful that we have some really uh, large uh, VC firms and some really strategic angels that were participated in our round um, that believe in continuing to do this work. Um, and I'm hoping that, you know, we'll be successful to allow them to continue to do that. That's fantastic. And I, I love that you are so committed not only to building your own business, but to just really proving, right, a model. Um, and that, that hopefully will start to create that flywheel. I think that's really commendable. Um, and exciting. Um, I'd love to hear also from our panelists, um, you know, there are, that's a great example, AJ, of like things are starting to happen. You know, there's some statistics about, you know, some very small movement in terms of funding for, you know, black founders, women founders, et cetera. Um, but the numbers are still so tiny, right? You know, less than 2%. Um, so still enormous, tremendous <laughs> opportunity to grow. Um, so I'd love to hear from you if there's, you know, a, a specific program, a fund or a group um, that has impressed you or supported you. Um, AJ, I know you just mentioned you had a handful, I think you said 82%. Um, but I'd love if there, if there are any kind of, you know, things you could share. And then I'd love to hear also Priyanka Maria, if you have seen or um, if there's anything happening within your organizations that you could share. Um, in terms of focus on underfunded, um, underrepresented groups. Yeah, I uh, I definitely have a, a few to shout out. <laughs> our, our lead investor is Authentic Ventures, um, a firm out of San Francisco led by Lindsay Lee. Um, and the way that Lindsay invests and the way that he builds relationship with his founders is what you want as an underrepresented founder who's doing this for the first time, who oftentimes I feel like I have no clue what I'm doing. Uh, he is, is, is detailed, he's in the weeds with me, he's in the trenches and is super helpful. And throughout the process of be, before he became the lead, he was also introducing me to other black led funds um, that he thought would be interesting for us before he even made that decision. It's always been from a, a, a place of service uh, versus like a transactional relationship, which has been great. Uh, mm -hmm. We also have Concrete Rose Capital Le and Level Up Ventures um, in our round as well. Uh, which are just doing some great work and, and continuing to invest in, in, in founders that we're supporting here today at this, at this Boodle um, competition. Uh, and, and they, again, like, I think the one thing that I'll say about Authentic, Concrete Rose, Level Up, and some of our other investors is when you get these investors that are dedicated to this mission and dedicated to this thesis, they work extremely hard 
to make sure they're proving out that thesis that yes, underrepresented groups can do this and can give good returns. So they have been so helpful on this journey since we closed our round. Um, and I'm grateful. And I think a lot of it is because we all have this shared uh, this, this shared vision of what we want the future of this space to look like. Um, and I, I definitely want to give authentic concrete rows and level up a lot of credit for the work that they're doing with me. Fantastic. Maria, how about you? Are there any, any groups you'd highlight or uh, anything that's happening at Madrona that you want to share? Yeah, so um, we work pretty closely with onboarding women and the Female Founders Alliance. Um, some areas that we've seen that are super important is beyond making sure entrepreneurs um, have great funding, is making sure that the teams that get funded have diverse leadership. So even if it's a male founder, that there's uh, female leaders on that team. And that's something we do. We work really closely with our founders super early to make sure their teams are structured that way, but also helping for our later stage portfolio companies as they're structuring their boards that they have women on their boards um, that are mentoring and bouncing ideas off of those CEOs and we provide access for women to have board seats. Great. And Priyanka? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one thing I am very passionate about personally, and I know many investors on the M12 investment committee are as well, is um, making sure that this, there's a certain proportion of uh, my weekly pipeline of founders who are uh, women and um, diverse uh, underrepresented founders. And um, for me, that number is 30%. So if I'm taking 15 to 20 calls a week, that's, you know, five to seven that I commit to having um, as diversely, uh, diverse candidates for, for investment. Um, and I've also just uh, built really strong relationships personally with All Rays, um, speaking about how, you know, speaking about of how networks influence sort of who comes into your pipeline, just making sure that um, like the sources I'm I'm really connected to uh, at the early stage, since we're mostly focused on series A and B. So if I'm looking at pre-seed and seed stage accelerators and um, incubators and funds, um, definitely making sure there's diversity in those sources. I'm also just very energized by what I see as sort of a nascent wave of, you know, diverse artists and athletes and even celebrities who are pushing for some of this cultural change. Um, like uh, I've worked a little bit with Pharrell Williams who launched, uh, not, not him personally, but he launched Black Ambition, which is an accelerator for Black and Latinx entrepreneurs to bridge you know, some of these gaps we're talking about. And then, you know, Serena Ventures, uh, Serena Williams Fund, just I stay close to them as well. Um, they want to give diverse female founders more opportunities to make it through to later stages in, in funding rounds. So yeah, um, on top of just advising at a board level and pushing, being that diversity champion and making sure that there's pipelines of diverse um, hires at, at a board level, um, making sure to source from sources that uh, champion diversity. And I just care a lot about this issue myself. So I uh, would be happy to take any suggestions anyone has as well. Thanks. Great. Yeah, we've talked a lot. I mean, that's definitely the theme, right? This this network, right? And it's just a really hard universe to kind of crack and, and break in. Um, what What is, where should someone start, right? And when they're in their early stages, how do they gain access or entry into the venture capital universe like what would what would be one smart move that you would recommend and i i can toss it to well you can go back to aj and <laughs> do our little loop again okay sounds good aj what do you think i, I i'm gonna defer to maria and priyanka on this <laughs> <laughs> still on the other side of the table, so I don't actually know. Um, I imagine it has a lot to do with networking and, and just being in the right places. And I think um, for anyone that's trying to break into any field, like the, the days of not having a personal brand are over. So I would suggest that they build a personal brand around who they are, what they believe in, and, and find a social network to do that on so that people find you uh, that, that need to find you. But I'll, I'll let um, these two more, way more educated folks <laughs> on venture capital speak about uh, how to break in. All right, Maria, what's your perspective on that? Yeah, it's a great question. I have a completely untraditional path to venture capital. I worked at uh, Gap Inc. right out of college in a rotational program. And so what I see most commonly happens is someone comes from either uh, investment banking or uh, management consulting, or they came from a product management role at a tech company. Um, I think that the best thing to do, though, is have a range of experiences that provide some sort of perspective and help differentiate you among different candidates. So 
um, having a few different roles, different work experiences that are super different. So you can provide different perspectives internally and add value to the team that way. Um, but also, I, I think the challenge of venture capital is there's a lot more talent than there are roles. So anything that someone can do to start to think about if they want to work in venture capital, what are other things that are adjacent that they can also do, maybe as they look for the right role. Um, so maybe it's working at a startup for a few years while also keeping in mind when the right opportunity comes up in venture capital um, to jump on it. Um, one other piece of advice I received while I was trying to break in is to be doing the job already. So that doesn't necessarily mean allocating your own money, but talking to startups, developing a perspective on what are the three things that need to happen for this startup to work? What are the three roadblocks this startup may face? Um, so you can have those conversations with people as you're looking for the right opportunity. Great advice. Um, Priyanka, what are your thoughts? Yeah, um, so I think, I think timing and where in your stage of your career does matter a bit. I would suggest that for folks who are, you know, right out of college or early in career, there are a lot more sort of formal programs to become an analyst or associate in venture closer to right out of college than ever before. Um, so if you know that venture is what you want to do, like you can always, um, in my experience, you can start in venture and go be an operator um, at a portfolio company or start your own company with relative ease. So if you've an inkling you want to do venture early on, like I would say go for it. Um, and yeah, I mean, other than that, uh, my sense is that proximity is power. So if you're able to just get more involved in all raise, get involved in networking opportunities in the venture capital operator community, um, you know, if you're affiliated with the university, there's always uh, tech transfer offices and VC clubs at every single uh, university these days. And so just getting close to that community. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's VCs publish blogs and thought pieces. And if you have an area of interest that aligns with a particular VC or a particular firm, don't hesitate to share shoot your shot and reach out. And like I cold called to get my first job in VC. So just don't be shy and know that you have a ton of value and you have a unique perspective and you are needed, especially, you know, if you're a diverse um, hire into VC. So yeah, just put yourself around people who can create opportunities for you. Great. Okay, I have one more question. Um, we have an awesome example in AJ of a success story. Um, of an entrepreneur that's had, you know, great results in raising funds, um, but would love to hear Priyanka and Maria from you. If you have a, a success story um, through your networks that you could share, and I know I'm sort of putting you on the spot on this one, but if, if there's one that you can think of, um, we'd love to hear an example. Happy to share just in terms of funding a diverse uh, yeah. founder. Yeah, yeah, I actually have four or five over the two years I met. I was at, uh, I have been at M12. So I'm very, very proud of that, probably more than any other thing I've achieved in uh, venture or at M12. Um, yeah, one in particular maybe. So um, I led the seed round of a company called Private AI that does pseudo anonymization and sort of uh, beefs up enterprise security posture. Um, the founder was Patricia Thane, this incredible uh, uh, former PhD candidate at the U of Toronto. I think she's actually on a leave right now to build her company. But um, through kind of a series of very like happy coincidences, um, just really became acquainted with her work and saw that she was a leader in the field of of, uh, you know, enterprise security SaaS and homomorphic encryption in particular. And um, even though she's not the typical profile of a data privacy founder in our portfolio or in the SaaS universe, um, she's an incredible person and really knows her stuff and coming out of a very uh, hardcore academic background. So really knows the guts of the operation. And um, yeah, we funded her and she's thriving and, you know, gone multiple uh, uh, growth, uh, uh, multiples on her uh, growth trajectory at this point since we found it, funded her about a year ago. And yeah, just really proud of her and all the other female and diverse founders um, I've written checks to. Great example. Maria, how about you? That's awesome. Um, I joined Madrona about four months ago as an investor, so I'm still early in um, my career in terms of writing checks to founders, but prior um, to joining Madrona, I raised a few angel syndicates um, and only invested in female founders. And 
Um, something that I've done since then is just stayed super close with them on when they're planning to raise and making sure that they're able to raise follow on capital and have um, the introductions they need to partner with investors for their next rounds. I have I actually have a couple examples, Nancy, of some. Oh, great. I'd love to hear them. Yes. That, that recently raised. So uh, my friend Chandler Malone uh, runs a company called Boot Up, um, which helps uh, people break into tech. Uh, and um, uh, allows you to be connected to employers. And he was able to just raise a $2.1 million round um, down here in Miami by all black led funds and black investors. Um, and it, things have been going so well, he's about to start raising again uh, here in a, in, a, in a couple of days. I think he just announced it today. Um, and then uh, also uh, Ariana Waller, who is um, known on Twitter as Ariana the Techie. Uh, she's running a company called Mushi, which is a, a NFC marketplace. Um, and she's a Web3 um, woman founder, um, self-taught software engineer. And um, she'll, she'll be announcing some really exciting things in, the, in a few. Um, just a really great success story there too. Both, both, all, both Miami founders as well. So there's a lot of good stuff happening down here in Miami. Fantastic. Great. Well, thank you all um, for your insights. What a, a great conversation. I'm sure we could go on and on. Um, and, you know, this is a huge discussion that clearly, you know, needs to continue beyond this space. Um, but for today, we'll we'll focus on our little contribution <laughs> to this change, um, which is the Voodoo Visionaries Grant Contest. Um, and I will turn it over to Priyanka, who's going to tell us about the process. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Nancy. Um, so when we entered into the judging process, I personally really looked forward to seeing a diverse group of entrepreneurs and just unique solutions. And I was not disappointed at all, to say the least. Um, all the applicants really moved us and it was uh, not easy picking a winner at all by any means. And um, yeah, I just want to highlight the fact that using Voodle for the contest was not only simple, but extremely fun and effective. Asynchronous video lets the pitches feel more personal and human and added an extra layer of meaning to my role as a judge as well. Um, by being able to watch on our own time, we were able to be more intentional and thoughtful with how we approached and reflected on each and every pitch. And I was really shocked to see how much I could learn in just a minute, as you'll soon see. So on behalf of the judges and on behalf of Voodle, I'd love to introduce you to the top three finalists of the Voodle Visionaries Grant 2022. And let's meet them by watching their Voodle pitches. Hi, my name is Allison Brininger, and I am the founder and executive director of The Negative Space, a nonprofit whose mission is to change the way caregivers are seen and supported. I've been a caregiver for my husband since his diagnosis of a rare genetic disease 11 years ago. And in that time, I've been by his side through a bone marrow transplant and multiple cancers. During these years, I have seen firsthand that caregivers are in the negative space. That is that they're a vital part of the picture, but are mostly unseen, unappreciated, and unsupported. So I created the negative space to shine light on the realities of caregiving. I provide direct services to caregivers like coaching and support groups and education. But in addition, my goal is to create systems change so that everywhere caregivers go, they are seen and supported. The way I am changing the workspace is by consulting with organizations who typically focus on patients to broaden their awareness, tools, and strategies to include support of caregivers as well. My goal is to bring caregivers into the light and give them the recognition and support that they need and deserve. Hi, I'm Sharon Eddings, and I'm the founder of Virtual Spy Room. At Virtual Spy Room, how we're changing the future of work is we're making sure all of our team members learn how to code. We introduce them to computer programming. Why? Because we're a tech-based escape room. So at Virtual Spy Room, players get 60 minutes to solve a case. Now, the cases are fictitious, but the fun is real. We've developed a software, something like you would see on CBS's FBI or the Queen Latifah's um, The Equalizer, the person behind the computer that searches the suspects, credit card statements, phone records, flight records, um, computers, anything like that. We created databases. And so our players get to solve the crime in 60 minutes, right? And if they don't, they can always come back and try again. But this is a fun way to use technology to make money. But we also want to make sure that we include women and people of color in technology. So with your support, we can take Virtual Spy Room to different states and cities and countries. The technology created today will inform the systems built tomorrow. Hi, my name is Diana Wilson and I am the lead servant at Yielding Accomplished African Women, where we are building the largest talent pipeline and online community of Black women in STEM 
across the entire diaspora. But why are we doing this? Because as we've seen with the recent injustice, that if we do not invest and build for our own communities, we are at risk of having the change we aspire for being lost. When you think of technology, think of legacy. Legacy allows us to build for tomorrow and allow it to sustain across generations. This is why we are investing in tech today. So join me. And we're thrilled to have all three finalists here live with us today. First, we have finalist number one, Allison Brenninger, The Negative Space. Now please meet finalist number two, Sharon Eddings, Virtual Spy Room. And last, but of course not least, finalist number three, Diana Wilson, Yielding Accomplished African Women. Good morning, thanks for having us. Hello, everybody. Hello, hello, thank you so much, it's such an honor. So amazing to have all of you. Okay, now let's hear from each of you on how your company impacts the future of work positively. Maybe we start with Allison, then Sharon, then Diana, thank you. Thanks so much, Priyanka, and everyone for having us today. It's really an honor to be here. I would love to share with you that I'm one of the 30 million people in the United States who not only works outside the home, but also takes on the role of being a primary caregiver for a loved one. So working caregivers like me, we're balancing the equivalent of two full-time jobs, one of which we're not paid for and we're not trained for. And so as you can imagine, the push and the pull of these responsibilities play an incredible toll on the well-being of the caregiver, as well as the quality of work that they're able to do, both at the office and at home. For most caregivers, though, it's imperative that we keep working. We have to get that income and we have to get the benefits for our families. And actually, research shows that it's good for the mental health of a caregiver to keep working so that they can have sort of um, their, they can continue to have some independence and some purpose that's outside the home as well. But the way the system is currently set up in most places is not sustainable. And it's not providing caregivers with the support that they need and that they deserve. So at the negative space, we're trying to attack this issue from both sides. We provide direct personalized support to caregivers. We help them with their unique situations to help them think about things like how can they work on their work-life balance? When and how should they talk to their employer about the fact that they are caregivers? When might it be a good time to bring in some extra help at home? And we're also working with employers to recognize that there are caregivers in every work setting and there's always going to be. And so how can they implement solutions for how they can provide their caregiving employees with the flexibility and the support that they need to be successful both at work and at home? So the number of caregivers is growing exponentially every year. And so the potential for scalability and growth is endless. And at the negative space, we're ready. Okay, so hi everybody, I'm Sharon Eddings. I'm the founder and CEO of Virtual Spy Room. And so I want to first start with why the future of work is so important to us. And it's because we wanna make work more meaningful so that we can enable our employees to achieve success, growth within the company. So how will we do this? We'll focus on career development. Simply put, the future of work is a projection of how work, the workplace, will evolve in the years ahead. It's the topic that keeps me up at night. As we look to the future, we're most concerned about reskilling and upskilling. So we believe this will be the key to our success. And so that's why we offer in-house training where we give each and every one of our team members the opportunity to learn how to code. Because we know that learning how to code is one of the most in-demand skill sets one can have in their toolkit. And so that's how we are attacking and working to improve the future of work. Thank you. Hello, everyone. And I'm so excited to talk to you guys about yielding accomplished African women. We are an ed tech nonprofit using technology to create possibilities for under-resourced and untapped Black female talent globally. We are connecting Black female talent all the way from Nairobi, Kenya to Brooklyn, New York. Through our platform, we are democratizing access to social capital, to learning and development, and to opportunities for their career. We are ensuring that Black women 
in college leave not only with a degree, but with six figure careers. We've already been able to garner $3.2 million in compensation packages for our women. And this is to attack the statistic of uh, inequity that black women currently face. Right now, just in the US alone, if we are able to reduce the earning gap for black women, we can increase jobs by 1.7 million and increase the annual US GDP by $450 billion. So when it comes to the future of work, if we invest in black women and prepare the largest youth population in the world for work, we are investing in the world, we are investing in our communities, and we are investing in innovations and technologies that the world has not seen yet. Thank you. Thank you so much. Such impressive companies you're building and each of you is incredible, obviously. Um, was wondering if each of you, just in the same order, could maybe for the audience talk about your experience fundraising and maybe just share a high and a low of the process for each of you. So Allison, Sharon, then Diana, thank you. Sure. We are a very brand new business. We have just recently gotten our um, our 501c3. And so with that, we just had a board meeting this week um, discussing this very topic because we are just at the groundbreaking moment of this. And so we have plans getting started about what that's going to look like um, to really bring in our community. We have community members who have been following us for quite a while, following our story and following our work and have been waiting for us to sort of be an official uh, nonprofit so that they can um, engage with us in that way. And so they've been saying, how can we help? And we are ready now. We are just making plans with the board about how to start the fundraising process. But because we are brand new, um, we're just getting started. So no highs and lows yet, but very much looking forward to getting started. Virtual Spy Room is actually a second business for me. And I learned a lot in my first business. And I had to get over the nose. I had to grow thick skin and that's what you have to do. You have to understand that, um, it, I guess it's a price to pay, right? It's a learning curve. Um, it's, we call it doing, uh, doing it ugly. You don't have the money. Um, you're probably spending your own money to you know, make ends meet. Um, I quit my job. Well, I didn't really quit my job. My job was outsourced to India. And so I just jumped in the deep water, right? And didn't know a lot. I really was, uh, working in my own business. And I had to learn how to start to manage my own business and hiring employees and all that I had to learn. I took, I really delve into the community. Like each city, you need to realize that it's entrepreneurial uh, programs that you can go to. And then you start to network. I had to learn how to network. And I had to start reading books and learning and watching Shark Tank and learning how to pitch. And then I had to realize that people are investing in you. And so you have to learn how to sell yourself. So I took comedy classes so I can get used to standing up in front of people talking. I actually, they're really good with the comedy classes, right? Um, and so you really have to start to mold yourself. and re First, you have to break yourself down and then rebuild your foundation and then build yourself back up. And so I'm at a point where I'm more comfortable speaking. Um, I know my business, the first business I didn't really know. This one, it was much easier to start because I knew and learned so much and I was able to put it together better. And then talk about what I know, um, you know, competitions or VCs want to learn. I have not raised um, VC capital, but I have won um, pitch competitions. And so we're ready to go to the next level. Highs and lows, there's been so many. So YAW is four years in operations and we have been able to raise half a million dollars in funding as a nonprofit. Um, and the highs is always build community. Our greatest um, form of income outside of our corporate sponsorships are from our community that we call Friends of YAW. And so they pay like they pay for Netflix, 20, um, well, I don't know how much Netflix is nowadays, but they pay $20 a month to support and further our cause. They are invested, we see them as investors. And as a nonprofit where we cannot give any stock or equity, we give our 
um, our communications and our friendship and loyalty to our community. And it's been such a high because they do so much more for us than just $20 a month. They talk about us. They help us um, anytime we need it. They do graphic design for us sometimes. They make sure that we're in their community, um, their company's community service days. And so it's a world of wealth when you tap into people. Um, and then Lowe's. Lowe's have been getting no's, getting many no's <laughs> and understanding um, why you're getting those no's. Um, and so it's always very humbling. And as a founder, you must remain humble or you're gonna really struggle because people are gonna tell you no, but those same no's are gonna be your best weapons for success uh, that will continue to allow you to grow. And so right now we're actually also in a um, nonprofit tech accelerator. And so we're looking um, to fundraise very quickly um, at the end of this uh, summer for another a million dollars. And so we're hoping that all of our no's and our community will stand by us to make us the a world-class nonprofit. So that's that's for us. Thank you so much for sharing so openly and authentically all of your experiences. We really appreciate it. And yeah, I mean, last question for the three of you. Um, would love to just hear the best advice you've been given on your journey. Um, maybe Allison, Sharon, then Diana. Thank you. Thanks. I think the best advice is to remember that, uh, that it's your story to tell and that no one else can tell it the way you can. And so obviously, as you heard from my Voodle pitch, that this is a really personal uh, thing for me. I have been a caregiver for my husband for 11 years and continue to be. And so I left my role in education to start this business from because of my own personal story, because I saw a need uh, that, I, that wasn't being filled. And so I think that that having our story drive this work and knowing that there might be other people doing other things, but no one else can tell our story the way we can, and no one else can can start to fill the need that we have seen firsthand needs to be filled. I think what I would like to share is just quotes and, and motivational things that I've listened to. It's going to be dark days. Um, you're going to be weeded out and separated. Nine times out of 10, and I'm pretty sure the other three um, finalists would, other two finalists would agree that we walk, you end up walking alone. Because normally when you're a founder or entrepreneur, you're the only entrepreneur in your group, right? And so you have to understand that this is a process. It's part of the process. You have to keep going. I call them mile markers. And as you get certain mile markers, people make different decisions, but you have to keep going. Um, it's, it's going to be dark. You're going to want to give up. It's uh, fall down seven times, get up eight, um, build, fail, build, build, fail, build, build, do something great, and then then you know, build, build, and then success, right? When you get your most fatigue, when you're most fatigued, you feel like you're drowning in shallow water. You can see your goal, but you're so tired. You're so exhausted. Just keep going. Do not give up, especially if you know it's something there, right? You have to keep going, um, have to stay focused, get around other entrepreneurs, um, find other people more successful to, than you. So either they can mentor you or you can look up to them so you can see where you're going. Um, and don't be surprised when you're called maybe weird or people shy away because you think different than other people because you're trying to climb. Um, people might try to knock you down, but you have to keep going and you have to fight. It's, it's the battle and you will win. Just do not give up. And I would say there's so many. Um, I would love to leave everyone with this. Live from identity, not for it. When you live from identity, you can live from the passions, from the experiences, from the traumas, from the pain, from the anger, from the joy, from the goodness of your life and put it out into the world. And Yielding Accomplished African Women is truly that for me. Uh, it is a fuse of my trauma, my pain, my sadness, my hope, for the world and for what black, what the world can see that black women can be and can do that was created and forged into a 501c3 organization and so when you live from identity you allow the world to see your heart and to see your passion and you will not easily stop or easily be stopped because you, no one can destroy what's in here 
They can destroy externally, but they can never destroy what's in here. And so as long as you have breath, you have a, you have a purpose, an identity, and a experience that the world needs to experience that would, gener that would change generations to come and hopefully leave a legacy that not only just your generations will be proud of, but the world would be proud that you were on this earth. Oh man, <laughs> y'all are amazing. Um, so as everyone just witnessed, uh, the passion and fire and ingenuity before us is really truly limitless. And all of you, the three of you finalists are truly special people. Um, you've innovated to take on huge problems in creative ways. You're teaching coding in a brand new way to support and create a more diverse future of computer engineering. You're taking on the caregiver crisis today to support and give space to caregivers in the workforce. Um, your leading programs to generate and sustain accomplished Black women in STEM fields. It's incredible. And so now the moment we've all been waiting for, I'm pleased to announce the win, uh, the winner of the 2022 inaugural Boodle Visionaries grant winner, Diana Wilson and Yielding Accomplished African Women. Congratulations, Diana. <laughs> Congratulations, Diana. Well deserved. So exciting. Um, you know, I, just listening to this whole conversation has been so moving and so inspiring. And what an incredible group of women I've got to, you can't tell hopefully, but I've got tears in my eyes. Um, so just proud and inspired by the work all of you are doing. Um, congratulations to Diana and Tamisha and your team. Um, very well deserved. Your work with Yielding Accomplished African Women um, inspired all of us. Um, and we're so honored to be a part of your journey in helping create this better, stronger future of work. Um, so we're really excited and we proudly present you with the first ever $10,000 Voodoo Visionary Grant. Um, along with that, you will have a featured 60 second spot during the GeekWire podcast throughout the month of April. So that will help you continue to tell your story and, and spread your news. Um, but wait, uh, my favorite thing to say, but wait, there's more. <laughs> so I mentioned up front that we do have um, a surprise. So I am really excited to share that um, the, our other two entrepreneurs, Allison and Sharon, will each also receive a prize of $2,500 from Foodle. So I, I, hopefully this will help Thank you continue you. Yes. to build your mission as well. Um, so congratulations to all of you. Um, just incredible, incredible work. Um, and I just feel so honored and grateful to be on the screen with all of you. I'm giving you all a big virtual hug. <laughs> um, a huge thank you to everyone who participated today um, from GeekWire, from Voodle, our incredible panel of judges um, for your insights and your hard work. And I don't know how you did it. I don't, <laughs> I don't know how the judges got, you know, what a tough choice. Um, so many incredible, inspiring entrepreneurs out there. So thank you all. Um, for those of you who are tuning in, if you'd like to get in touch with any of these founders, um, you can go to voodle.com slash grant. Um, you can see their pitch videos there um, and reach out to them directly. Um, and you know, while the Voodle Visionaries grant you know, wraps up today, um, the end of this beautiful Women's History Month, um, our commitment to fighting for a more inclusive startup community um, will continue. Um, it doesn't end today. So again, thank you to everyone who participated um, and helped make today's event possible. Um, again, honored to be here with all of you, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you, and congrats again. <laughs>